Good evening. You are viewing a presentation from the Agency for Public Information. I'm Sheridan Lewis. On this evening's program, the 2016 estimates are presented in Parliament. And later on the program, we learn about the Eastern Caribbean Single Insurance and Pension Market Project and the public consultations that are taking place throughout the Eastern Caribbean. Stay with us. The program continues in just a moment. Two islands and keys are waiting to be discovered. Take a look at us now. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Welcome back. Section 70, subsection 1 of the Constitution of St. Vincent and the Grenadines provides that within 30 days of the commencement of the financial year, that the estimate should be prepared and laid before the House of Assembly. In keeping with this provision, Minister of Finance and Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzales led his team of ministers and presented the 2016 estimates of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the House of Parliament on Friday, January 29. The spending of up to one twelfth of the recurrent expenditure of the preceding year and that all capital expenditure which the Minister of Finance approves could also be spent in the period. So the business of government continues. That's what the Financial, the Finance Administra the Financial Administration Act, which replaced the old Finance and Audit Act, and we had caused that new Financial Administration Act to be passed in this Honorable House. And I want to draw attention to Section 71 of the Constitution, because, Mr. Speaker, there are persons who may say, well, how can you then go ahead and be spending money until you pass the appropriation bill? You can do that for as long as you want, and the answer is no. But there is a, a time period, and Section 71 provides of the Constitution for the authorization of expenditure in advance of appropriation. And the section reads, there shall be such provision as may be made by Parliament, under which if the appropriation law in respect of any financial year has not come into operation by the beginning of that financial year, the minister for the time being responsible for finance may authorize the withdrawal of monies from the consolidated fund for the purpose of meeting expenditure necessary to carry on the services of the government until the expiration of four months from the beginning of that financial year or the coming into the operation of the law, that is to say, the appropriation law, whichever is the earlier, and go up to four months. Of course, I intend to bring to the House the appropriation bill in the month of February. I think it is important that all of this is explained, Mr. Speaker, even before I begin to have the countdown of my time on the, the debate on the motion itself, because I have read a few things by persons who don't take time to read the law or to be advised on it, and I read things that they have said which are not correct. And I've heard things on radio which are not correct. And especially since we have students here who are in the fourth and fifth form, I believe, and who are studying this particular area of public administration, that I draw to their attention. Of course, I'm quite sure that their teachers are aware of all these provisions and more. 
but it is important that I explain. In short, therefore, the government as always functions within the four walls of the law in accordance with our commitment for good governance. Mr. Speaker, the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the fiscal year 2016 amount to 912 million 897 thousand three hundred and eleven dollars this year's budget is some six percent or fifty eight point five million dollars below the amount budgeted for 2015 and the reduction in the total outlay in 2016 is accounted for on the capital side of the budget which is just about 33 percent less than the planned capital program last year. And I will have more to say about this because, again, I've read some misinformation. Mr. Speaker, clearly, if some programs are, in the, are winding down, like, for instance, the Argyle International Airport, where much less money is budgeted this year than last year, you would expect that the capital side to be less. And there are other things. but. There are persons who may not be interested in the truth. And it is our business to present the numbers so that you can understand them. And just at the beginning to say that the, there's a modest increase on the recurrent side of the budget, but there is a decrease on the capital side of the budget. And I shall explain all those reasons very shortly for the increase and the decrease, respectively. The budget for 2016 is made up as follows. Recurrent expenditure, inclusive of amortization and sinking fund contributions, $715,228,341 as recurrent expenditure. And capital expenditure, amounts in the estimates to $197,668,970. Mr. Speaker, the budget is financed by recurrent revenue of $564,627,600, and capital receipts totaling $348,269,000, $711, making the total between the recurrent and the capital to come up to the amount required to finance the budget, as I've just indicated. Prime Minister Gonzales, in his presentation, also highlighted five new initiatives relating to elements of reorganization. These five new initiatives in the estimates that I want to highlight are the following. There's a new ministerial portfolio, the Ministry of Economic Planning, Sustainable Development, Industry, Information, and Labor. The details of this ministry can be found on pages 137 to 179 in the current estimates and pages 548 to 551 in the capital estimates. The total budget allocated to this new ministry is $30.38 million. This ministry is expected to play a pivotal role in the economic development thrust of the government in the upcoming year and beyond. Second initiative, bundle of them. Other ministerial portfolio changes must also be noted. The portfolios of National Reconciliation and Ecclesiastical Affairs, they have been added to the Ministry of Education. Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit, which hitherto were in the office of the Prime Minister, and now in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade, Commerce, and Regional Integration. And the Public Sector Reform Unit, which was elsewhere 
now falls under the responsibility of the office of the Prime Minister. The third initiative in the presentation of the estimates is this. The ministries of finance, agriculture, education, national mobilization, and health. They reflect important changes. These five ministries have been selected as pilots in the ongoing strategic budget reform initiative currently being implemented by the Ministry of Finance. Among the objectives of the reform, and Mr. Speaker, I would say that in these pilots, as you would see, when you look into the estimates, you see a different layout for finance, agriculture, education, national mobilization, health. These five ministries. And what we are doing here is to carry out a reform among the objectives of which reform is to strengthen further the linkages between the government's strategic policy priorities and the budget and to improve performance management in sharpening the focus of the measurement and delivery of the results. So we have to link better government's strategic priorities which have been laid out, like for instance, in our development plan, like for instance, which were laid out in the ULP's manifesto, and which are incorporated into policy objectives in the government, strategic policies to link those with the budget. Because the policies can be out there, but they have to be linked with the budget to be given life and meaning. And clearly, having done that, we have to make sure that we perform. And the, the reforms are also in part connected to improving performance management by sharpening the focus of the measurement and delivery of the results, which are among the things which we promised the electorate for this fourth term. Mr. Speaker, as you would notice, I take very seriously, and this government takes very seriously, when we speak to the people. And sometimes you may hear something, and you may consider that they're just words, until you witness the full elaboration and their connection in practice. For example, Mr. Speaker, in this streamlining, of the program structures in the ministries. Let's take the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health, which hitherto had 18 programs listed, in the old estimates, there are now six. One of the main issues with the old structure was that the programs reflected the organizational units rather than the functional areas of the ministry. In the 2015 estimates, for example, Mr. Speaker, the Milton Keaton Memorial Hospital was classified as Program 664, as an organizational unit. But the Milton Keaton Memorial Hospital as an organizational unit clearly is within the hospital services function of the ministry, because that's the functional classification. And therefore, it is no longer by itself, but incorporated under this functional classification. One of the features of the estimates over the years is the inclusion of result indicators for each ministry. And while these indicators Result indicators provide a fair insight into the achievements and strategic focus of the respective ministries. They tend to be too qualitative and not always output focused. So that in the presentation of the five pilot ministries mentioned earlier, honorable members will observe the strategic priorities of the ministry and they are laid out on the front page of each ministry 
and they will also observe the, strate the strategies and main activities for each program within the ministry and they are listed at the program level and you would also see the output indicators and targets which are shown for each program for 2016 to 2018. In other words, we, 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 we're trying to, as I repeat, link the strategic objectives to the budget to improve performance and in the measurement of that performance, rather than having the result indicators formulated largely in qualitative terms, they will have a more output, direct output orientation. The fourth new initiative is the introduction of a new chart of accounts. The new code and structure for the classification of revenue and expenditure has been adapted from the IMF's Government Finance Statistics Manual of 2014. The classification guidelines for this new char chart of accounts, Mr. Speaker, can be seen by honorable members at Roman numerals 9 to 14 in the estimates. And finally, in these estimates, in terms of the initiatives, we have changed the way in which the budget for contribution to regional and international organizations is allocated. For many years, the funds budgeted for contributions to these organizations, for the most part, were allocated centrally in the Ministry of Finance. In the 2016 estimates, these funds have been allocated to the respective ministries under whose responsibility each organization falls. This small change harmonizes the budgetary treatment of contributions to regional and international organizations with that of local organizations and effectively devolves responsibility and administrative control where it should be at the ministry level. So that, for instance, if there's a clerical error in respect of a short payment of $2,000 to the United Nations for our contribution, you're not chasing around between different places to see where this error arose and why this was not corrected and dealt with in an expeditious manner. So that the accounting officer will have direct responsibility, and the, di the accounting officer being the permanent secretary. Mr. Speaker, I want to address the current estimates, not the capital side, the recurrent side. The 2016 recurrent expenditure, exclusive of amortization and sinking fund contributions, and for the students who are listening, amortization is the payment down on the debt, and the sinking fund is a requirement in law that when bonds, uh, government bonds are sold, these instruments, to, for confidence to be given to the purchase of those bonds, that you don't wait until the end of the life of the bond to pay the money that on an annualized basis, on an ongoing basis, you put money into the sinking fund so that when your bonds are matured, you get your money. Of course, you'll get your interest on a half yearly basis as you proceed, but you'd make sure that you get your money at the end of the period, that it is put aside in this special pot, so to speak. That's, that's simply what it is. So, as I've indicated before, current expenditure, exclusive of amortization and sinking fund, amongst to five hundred and seventy-six million five hundred and fifty-three thousand one hundred and ninety-eight dollars. Current revenue, on the other hand, is estimated at five hundred and sixty-four million six hundred and twenty-seven thousand six hundred dollars. As a result. The budgeted current account balance shows a deficit of $11,925,598. This deficit, Mr. Speaker, for this year's budget on the current account is 58% below that of the 2015 budget. I just want to indicate that even though, Mr. Speaker, we had 
a, a budgeted deficit for the 2015 budget on the current account of $28.5 million. The preliminary outturn for 2015 shows, the fiscal outturn showed that we had a surplus of $6.2 million. So in the management of the, the budget itself, one mixes prudence and enterprise to ensure that the numbers do not get away with you and you as much as possible stay close to the wind. On this occasion, we are budgeting for an $11.9 million deficit on the current account, 58% below the deficit of last year budget. The current revenue estimate for 2016 is 6.1% or 32.28 million higher than the budgeted current revenue for 2015. The improved performance of the revenue, Mr. Speaker, in this year's budget, the recurrent budget, is hinged on an anticipated uptick in, the, in economic growth in 2016 and a stronger effort by the main revenue agencies to collect the taxes due and payable. Revenue from tax sources is expected to contribute $482.4 million to the Consolidated Fund while non-tax revenue is estimated at $82.3 million. Tax revenue is estimated to increase by 8.3%, driven mainly by the strong growth in taxes on incomes and profits, and taxes on goods and services, which are projected to increase by 11.9% and 10.5%, respectively. Mr. Speaker, some of what I've been talking about can easily be seen on the financial summary and in respect of the, the revenue details which I'm giving, honorable members can look at page one for the details of current revenue and the subsequent pages would explain the summary of the details of the revenue, of the current revenue. Together, Mr. Speaker, these two taxes, that is to say, on incomes and profits and goods and services, I expected to yield $298.2 million in revenue, or some 52.8% of the total current revenue for 2016. Of course, taxes on international trade and transactions at $142.4 million, which is up by 4.7%, remain a very important source of funds for the government. In the area of the non-tax revenue, of the $82.2 million expected from this source in 2016, from the category sales of goods and services, the revenues are projected to generate $64.2 million. The custom service charge at $44.2 million will be the main contributor to this revenue source. And the full details of the current revenue estimates, Mr. Speaker, as I've indicated, you can be found the summary at page one, and then you can go on to page 13, from one to 13, and those details are there. Recurrent expenditure. The total recurrent expenditure inclusive of amortization and sinking fund contributions amount to $715.2 million. This figure is 6% or $40.2 million above the sum budgeted in 2015. So we see that the recurrent expenditure is up. And for 2016, this is made up as follows. Current expenditure, $576.5 million. Amortization, that is to say, the paying down on the debt, domestic and Foreign external debt, $116.7 million, and the sinking fund contributions of $22 million. Mr. Speaker, all three components of the recurrent expenditure register increases in 2016. The current expenditure itself, exclusive of amortization and sinking fund contributions, that has increased by 2.8%. Under 
the rubric of current expenditure, I'd like to highlight the following items. Wages and salaries are increased in this budget by $7.3 million, or 2.7%. This is for the central government employees. Pensions and NIS are up by $6.1 million, or 10.5 percent. I'm talking about pensions and NIS contributions. Notice the increase in one year by 6.1 million dollars, or 10.5 percent. It's a it's a huge increase. And other transfers, which includes social assistance, training scholarships and the like for the students who are going off to university, grants and contributions to local and regional organizations, the other transfers category, which amounts to $105.4 million. The increase for that over last year is $2.9 million or 2.8 percent. The summary of the recurrent expenditure budget by economic categories is as follows. Salaries and wages, and this is what we are spending on wages and salaries in the central government this year, $281.8 million. I want that number to sink in. And that's why I'm asking our public servants and all categories of workers, please give the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines value for the money what we're spending. At all levels, in all areas, public servants, police, nurses, doctors, teachers, um, casual workers. We know that you do a, a good job, and I want to thank you, but I'm asking you, particularly in challenging times, to up your game. It's a lot of money we are spending. $281.8 million. The next category, pensions and NIS. That is to say, the pensions which we pay for those who have retired, and the NIS contributions paid by the government for the current employees, $64 million. So you notice between the salaries and the pension payments which we are making and the NIS contributions is $335 million, $335.8 million. So it's a lot of money. Other transfers, like the, what we pay for the public assistance and the scholarships and so on and so forth, and contributions to regional and local and international organizations, $105.4 million. Debt services, $191.4 million. Goods and services, $72.6 million, making it a total of $715.2 million. In respect of the category wages and salaries, it's broken down as follows. Salaries, $240.9 million. Allowance, $20.3 million. Wages, $20.6 million, giving you $281.8 million. In the 2016 budget for wages and salaries, when compared to the actual salaries bill for 2015, registers an increase of 9.6%. I was talking about the comparison with the budget, but I'm talking about the actual which we spent last year to what we budget to spend this year on wages and salaries. It increases by 9.6%. This figure includes the 4% salary increase. Remember the increase in December and the increase in January? The usual automatic increments, 
which is just over 2% on an average in the public service, plus provisions for the filling of some vacancies in vital areas in the public service. What we have sought to do, Mr. Speaker, in the 2016 budget is to focus our efforts in respect of the new posts to those which connect to the strategic priorities of the government. And to this end, in these estimates, 27 additional posts are being provided for. 21 of them in the medical nursing and support staff at the modern medical complex at Georgetown that is expected to come into operation later this year. Showing the emphasis which we are placing on health. And six posts under the internal audit unit, Ministry of Finance, which were in last year's estimates, but which were not funded. Coming up, the ECCU single insurance and pension market gets on the way here. Stay with us. The program continues in just a moment. They are small and impressionable. How you interact with them is very important. So don't believe for one second that anything you do won't leave a lasting impression. The power to make a positive impression is in your hands. By playing with them, reading to them, talking and singing to them, you can help them develop positively because children are never too young to learn. This message was brought to you by the UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, the Caribbean Child Support Initiative and this station. Welcome back. The Financial Services Authority, FSA, in collaboration with the Steering Committee of the Implementation of the ECCU Single Insurance and Pension Market, staged a public consultation recently, with SAW stakeholders here engaged in discussions on plans and the progress of the project. The API had the opportunity to speak with two members of the Steering Committee on key issues of the project. Has more in the following report. The establishment of an integrated insurance and pension market in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, ECCU, is a new thrust commissioned by the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to promote a more efficient and better regulated insurance and pension market in the ECCU. The Monetary Council also established a steering committee to implement the project and so far, public consultations have been held in various Eastern Caribbean islands to heighten awareness of the features of this project. On Friday, January 29, a number of stakeholders converged at the Methodist Church Hall for the local round of consultations. Elena Estefan is the Deputy Executive Director of the Financial Services Authority, FSA, and member of the steering committee of the ECCU Single Insurance and Pension Market, and explains the genesis of the project. In the past, insurance has traditionally lagged behind many of the other sectors. And when I say lag behind, not, not so much in activity or performance, but in terms of having the kind of um, framework that, say, the banks have enjoyed or some of the other non-banks. Um, so, you know, that's not to say we don't have a relationship with the insurance sector as well. The existence of industry groups tends to facilitate um, our interaction with the insurers as a whole. And we've not had the luxury of, of that in the past, although now, um, as I understand it, we now have a, a revival of the industry um, professional grouping. So we expect to have a, a better collaboration and, and coordination with the industry. Um, as a whole. Uh, in our work program though we do in fact interact on a very regular basis with individual insurers um, that are licensed here in St. Vincent. Nigel Street is the Deputy Executive Director of the FSA of Grenada and Coordinator of the Steering Committee of the ECCU Single Insurance and Pension Market. Beginning in 2011, 
there was a lot of discussion as to how could we improve the insurance and pension market in the Eastern Caribbean. So you had policymakers, and here I'm referring to the Monetary Council, and the Monetary Council is the Council of Ministers of Finance in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, and that is the, uh, the eight islands which uses the EC dollar, the Eastern Caribbean uh, dollar. And I think those ministers of finance, recognizing some of the challenges uh, posed uh, or created by uh, institutions which ran into difficulties and also issues from on the international front, uh, you know we were going through a general financial crisis, recognized that our the arrangement we had in place was not as resilient as it needed to be and it did not allow for the level of efficiencies that they should be. So discussions began as to how could we improve the market and that led to uh, a paper being done, a research paper on improving uh, the structure of the market and then we had a lot of consultation with insurance uh, practitioners, Ministry of Finance official regulators as to how best we could move forward. Since then, a number of discussions were held among key stakeholders and the steering committee with the view of seeking to establish a single insurance and pension market across the Eastern Caribbean. To some extent, we have structures like that already in place. Um, you know, we have the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, for example, and we have the um, Eastern Caribbean Civil A Aviation Authority, many of them which work across the region in a kind of seamless way. But I think this is a first in terms of um, financial services, where we see the, the, the project seeks to establish a uniform market, a single financial space for insurance and pensions. And in some instances, we've been asked, well, why is it just for insurance and pensions? And, and I think Nigel alluded to this, that based on some of the past events in, in the sector um, and the focus that has been given to that particular particular sector by the Monetary Council in an attempt to strengthen and, and make the market a little more robust uh, to increase the effectiveness of supervision in the, in the sector. Um, the decision was taken to begin first with, with this particular sector, but the intention I believe as we go along, and, and that of course is left to the policy makers, is to include um, the other non-bank institutions, uh, for example, the credit unions, money services businesses. Um, and again, Nigel spoke to this, the fact that there are economies of scale uh, to be had um, in, in sort of um, consolidating the, the regulation of the non-banks. So although it begins with insurance and pensions, there is great potential for expanding that to other non-bank institutions. Key elements is the establishment of a single market and what that means is creating a single space with, within which insurance and pension products and services could be bought and sold, uh, making a, a, creating a structure where an insurance or a pension practitioner or a pension fund is established in one jurisdiction but is able to service members in other jurisdiction or an insurance company is established in one jurisdiction but has the uh, ability or ha is eligible to also offer its services in another jurisdiction. Uh, we're looking at uh, the market comprising the eight uh, member territories of the ECCU. Uh, all of those uh, territories would have an opportunity to participate in the market and insurers would have an opportunity to access and service that broader market. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is having one regulator. So you would have, instead of eight regulators as we currently have in the region, you would have one insurance regulator. That insurance regulator would have regulatory authority for the market, that extended market that I referred to, and as such, that regulator would have a responsibility and would be identified in the legislation of each of the jurisdictions. So one market, one regulator. And the third aspect is uniform legislation. So you would have uniform legislation that would form the basis of the regulatory infrastructure in that, uh, that market. Uh, so it means that an insurer or a broker or an agent operating in that market will be exposed to the same piece of legislation or the, or the same provisions in every island that they operate in. The ECCU Single Insurance and Pension Market Project seeks to embrace not only the economic realities of the region, but promotes free movement within a single space. It's a new concept, there's no question about that. 
uh, particularly for financial services, as I mentioned earlier. And um, it's clearly going to require a whole almost um, strategic thinking and, and of, of companies and, and a review of business models of the stakeholders who will be, who will be affected. And I say that it will affect, you know, it, it really doesn't matter size of, of a company. Um, it really requires one to do a rethinking of strategy and business model to make the best use of the benefits and opportunities that the market will present. Um, so I see that as being across the board and not necessarily for St. Vincent only. Um, but I see St. Vincent and Nationals as, as being um, common to the ECCU. I mean, we've been hearing about a single space, a uh, single mo um, free movement of people. Um, you know, this is not a new concept. This is just something that has taken a while to materialize. And I think this particular project sort of pushes it in one direction uh, with tremendous potential and benefits, not only for the stakeholders, but particularly for consumers and for regulators as well. So I think it's something to be embraced. And we're very hopeful through these public consultations uh, to be able to engage stakeholders uh, in, in listening to um, what they see as, as possible potential problems uh, and, and, and that's why we're here to receive those comments and recommendations to ensure that we, we get it right and we get it in a form that's workable and can deliver uh, the kinds of opportunities and benefits that we see it capable of delivering. Beginning with the 2008-2009 crisis in the region with the, in some insurance companies running into difficulty. You have regulators working a lot closer together. We've been having a lot of meetings. We've been having a lot of discussions. We've had colleges of, of regulators where we've been working together. So I think what you've been having is a bit of a conversion of interest. The regulators working a lot closer. You have the Monetary Council, which is a council of ministers, which already work quite closely together because that is the oversight body for the central bank. So they already have that. Uh, you have the fact that uh, we have other successful regional institutions. So we in the region, we are used to working together. Uh, we have cases where because of similarities in our legal system, in our financial system, it does lend itself to us working together. So I agree, there are differences, but there are a lot of similarities. I think there are more things that bring us together than what separate us. But I also agree that there have to be a process to bring everybody on board so that people have a shared vision and a shared view as to how the project should work. And this, the consultation we have in now is part of that, but this process began a long time before this. And I say it began at the highest level decision making, which is at the Monetary Council level. And now it's been cascaded all the way down to all of the, the players, all of the, the stakeholders, including the general public, insurance practitioners, uh, regulators, what have you, government officials. But the idea is to start that discussion throughout the region, look at what are some of the challenges, some of the issues, so that the, the market is able to better reflect those and the market is better able to respond to those. In highlighting some of the challenges of the ECCU's single insurance and pension market project, Street explains the committee's strategies in overcoming these challenges. Well, this is a multi-island project, so we're trying, to, we're trying to develop something that's going to impact eight islands. So that, by its very nature, you have logistical issue, just, just being there and being able to interact with all of the stakeholders. We've been lucky in that there are regulators, there are government officials, uh, there are industry people in all of those islands. So what we sought to do is to put together a steering committee of all of those key individuals so that we have the, that reach and we have that engagement. So that has, has been quite important. But that is a challenge, uh, the, the geography of the project. Uh, it's also new. And with everything that's new, it takes a little while for people to, to get up to speed and be on board with it. And we understand that. So we don't have an, an issue with the fact that uh, people have questions. They want to, to understand fully what the process is. And I think that is as it should be. Um, some of the issues involve changes to legislation. And change in legislation takes time. There's an involved process in that as well. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily red tape, but I would say the structure of what we're trying to do requires some of that, that happening. So it takes a little bit of time, but I think it's understandably so, and we want to make sure that we get it right. So I don't view it as much as an impediment, but a feature of the process. 
as we go through the jurisdictions, there are issues that arise, some of which may not have been addressed previously, and we're moving quickly uh, to deal with that. We recognize that there's some gaps in the law, there are areas that still need to be filled um, that we're working on as well. So we do have a, a timetable, um, which is uh, the second to third quarter of 2017 for completion of this project. But we well recognize that there is some sort of maneuvering that we may have to do uh, in there as well because a significant part of the project involves uh, the legislation to be passed in eight territories, uniform legislation. Um, and you know the challenges that that, that can bring with individual um, legislative timetables. So you know these are just practical uh, issues that we have to deal with when you're dealing with, with eight territories. The commission agreement, for example, uh, before it comes into effect has to be ratified by the territories. But we're also looking at not uh, moving ahead uh, with establishment with at least five members um, with the option for the others to, to join in um, subsequently. So there are, there are certain mechanisms that allow us um, to progress. Now, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a, um, a new concept for us in financial services, and we expect uh, that as the market develops, there's going to be um, various amendments that may be required to the law to address issues. Because, you know, the law, as good as it is, um, and as prospective as, as it is um, in its practical implementation, there are issues that will arise from time to time. And so we, we ex anticipate that there will be certain amendments uh, that may be required, maybe uh, in terms of the structure of the commission, there may be certain adjustments, uh, but but that's, that's, that's not to say uh, that it should impede our progress right now. I think we need to look at getting it right now, getting the foundation right, which is what part of these public consultations are about, to ensure as far as possible we have a law that's workable, we have a market um, that's amenable to strengthening and, and, and increasing opportunities for stakeholders. And as we go on to, to make the adjustments, we need to, uh, to deliver on, on that project. To date, the steering committee has staged public consultations in Antigua, Dominica, Anguilla, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and will move to St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Montserrat. As we discuss the project, there are two, there are two uh, positions. One, there's a bit of apprehension. It's new, it's different. People are still getting to understand what is involved, and that is understandably so. So we spend a lot of time explaining to people how the project is supposed to work and what are the benefits in it for the various stakeholders. What are the benefits for the consumers? What are the benefits for uh, the industry in terms of the, the brokers, the agents, what have you? What's the benefits for the government, the policy, the, 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 the policy makers? And I think that's something we could talk, talk about as well. But there are benefits in there for each of those categories of, of individuals that I just mentioned. And I think as we spend time talking to people, as I say, the natural and, and the first reaction is apprehension, but they, they then become more understanding of what is, is being worked on and how it could benefit them and the impact it could have on them. Then you, of course, have some stakeholders who are more receptive to the change and, and they are quick to see the opportunities and they're, well, let's go, why is it taking so long? So one of the questions is, why is this thing taking so long to happen? And again, I, I say that we are also anxious for it to happen, but it's a deliberate process in that you want to make sure that you get it right. Uh, so yes, you want speed, but uh, you probably need to hasten slowly so that you make sure you, you get all of, all of the key aspects done right and all of the persons who are going to be affected have an opportunity to, to uh, give their views, uh, participate in the process. Um, but but the, re the reaction has been quite good. We've gotten a lot of feedback. Uh, uh, the legislation itself is now, we're going through the third phase of that. And at every phase, we've gotten a lot of comments, a lot of feedback. We've responded to all of the comments. We've provided a feedback matrix, which identify all of the feedback we've received and what we've done with it. So the coordinator of the steering committee describes the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadine support to the ECCU single insurance and pension market project as tremendous. Your Prime Minister, Prime Minister Ralph, the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, he sits on the Monetary Council and he has been quite a champion in terms of this process. He chairs the subcommittee on insurance. In fact, when the whole process started, when the challenges of 2008, 2009, Bico, Clico, all of that started, the Monetary Council 
which is actually set up to provide guidance and, and supervision to the central bank. The Monetary Council recognized the importance of insurance and set up a special subcommittee to deal with insurance. And we are very grateful for the, the work of Honorable Ralph Gonzalez in, in chairing that committee. And, such, and as such, that committee has formed the basis and is, is kind of the focal point for the whole project going forward. So I think of, of probably all of the jurisdiction, St. Vincent is probably well placed given the leadership that, that your Prime Minister has shown in moving this process forward. The landscape of insurance and pension market is expected to transform in each island positively with far-reaching effects within the region uh, it's going to it's going to change in that you will now have one market instead of eight markets so currently you have eight markets you have eight jurisdictions with eight regulators with eight markets and a company that wants to operate in this space will need eight license if it wants to operate in all of the island that's going to change a company that wants to operate in this space will need one license and that one license would provide it with access to all of the participating territories so that is one key feature you would also have one regulator, which means that the cost of regulation should be reduced. In that, both the cost and the regulatory burden, because instead of you having to respond to the needs of eight regulator, regulators, you would be doing it with one regulator. So a company that probably operates in four jurisdictions currently would need to provide forms and returns and, and meet uh, licensing and regulatory requirement in each of those islands. In this case, that same company who operates in the four jurisdiction will be responding to one regulator. So that is also going to be a change. Then there's a number of uh, market conduct and consumer protection provisions which are now in this piece of legislation that doesn't currently exist. So it creates much stronger provisions for protecting uh, consumers uh, and it, in, in terms of protecting the rights of consumers and making sure that they're treated fairly and making sure that they have redress in the event that something goes wrong. So there are a lot of these provisions which strengthens the bill and strengthens the regulatory process. So in terms of the landscape, I think what you would probably find is that now that it's a single market, you might actually find companies coming together to work together. So I might be a small company in St. Vincent and I have another and there's another small company in Grenada and Dominica, what have you. You might find that those companies decide, why don't we uh, come together and form a, a strategic alliance so that we could better provide the services that, that we currently provide. Or maybe you would find companies identifying a particular niche where they're very strong. No, it might not be as uh, efficient or as, as a lucrative to to do that niche in St. Vincent alone because it would be too small but let's say you're a very good motor company you might say okay I want to specialize on motor and I'll be the best motor company in the in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union and because it's a much bigger market I could just do motor and still do it very well and and you know be successful at it but if I was in St. Vincent alone, I would say, well, Moto alone is not sufficient to, to carry me. So I think you would also find changes in companies' business models in terms of how they do business, that uh, in reacting to the opportunities available, they would also be more creative in terms of how they configure themselves, what products, what service, what kind of alliances they're into, into uh, the use of technology, how much technology they use in terms of being able to uh, distribute their products and services. This act, uh, this bill once it's finalized and passed is going to be one of the primary um, pieces of legislation in financial services that really takes into account consumer protection and this uh, this is, is, is evolving uh, globally uh, in terms of financial services the protection for the consumer both in terms of disclosure and transparency and fairness of treatment um, and but I think it really sets a trend in financial services in, in, in from the point of view that it's not to say that these concepts are not currently um, entertained in, in, in um, our current regulation but it actually seeks to make it part of the law so that where there's a breach of these um, provisions, then it becomes an issue for the Commission to, to take this up directly with, with service providers. Some of the provisions for consumer protection include, there must be prominent notice of unusual terms, and insurers that unreasonably delay paying claims must pay interest to the consumer. An insurer must give reasons for claims denied, and insurers will need to set up a process for receiving and resolving complaints from consumers and must resolve them fairly. 
Reporting for the API, I am Sheridan Lewis. Here's where we end this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. On behalf of the production team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lewis. Good evening.